Well, good morning, everyone. I want to extend a warm welcome to everybody here as we gather together for our special anniversary celebration today. I know there's some conversations happening out in the foyer. We welcome you to come on in as we get started. Uh, this is a, a great weekend, of course. Yesterday we spent the day, the afternoon, with uh, inviting. As you know, our mission is to invite people to join us in following Jesus. So we invited our community and our neighbors to come to our church uh, yesterday as we had an open house. This place was buzzing with people. It was absolutely fantastic. Lots of energy and smiles and joy and people asking questions, some great fellowship that was happening. And uh, we are so grateful for that. And today we're going to be celebrating our 30th anniversary, which is something to celebrate for sure. So yeah. Now, technically, our anniversary was January the 3rd of this year, but we waited until this weekend because we knew we wanted to combine it with our open house of our new building. And, uh, and we're excited to be at this place. Uh, 30 years ago, the leaders of the church at that time selected a verse from 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. And it says this, For we are co-workers in God's service, you are God's field, God's building. Now the context of this is Paul is talking to the church at Corinth and he's saying, Apollos and myself are co-workers. And, and he talks about how we planted the seed, we watered the seed, but God made it grow. And, and he says to the church at Corinth, he says, you are God's field. This is the seed that was planted in you. And this is the, the blessing that results. And then he also uses the analogy that you are God's building. And, and that's unique because uh, they didn't have buildings for churches back in those days. They met in, in homes. And, and we're very grateful for this physical building that we have. But that's not the real story. The real story is that you are God's building. That you and I, who are believers in Jesus Christ, we're part of what God is doing, that he's building in us something beautiful, something wonderful, and it's based upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we want to celebrate. Yes, we're grateful for this building, we're grateful for the expansion and the renovations and so on, but the real story is that we are grateful for God's building, for each of you and what God is doing in us. Amen to that. Amen. So this day is, we're calling it Markers Along the Way. So we're talking about significant events that have happened in the life of our church over the last 30 years. We're talking about birth, growth, maturing, and also future blessing. And there's actually a lot more that we could talk about. We just don't have the time. Uh, even on the wall there, you have different markers. And, and we have little markers for you to write on there. Any significant event that you want to declare that you want to share uh, about the, any births or weddings or discipleship or baptisms or, or whatever you want. It's all there. We want to encourage you to do that over the next couple of weeks. But even today, we want you to start doing that. So we have several people that are going to be sharing this morning. And if everyone behaves themselves, we'll be done by noon. If they don't behave themselves, we're here till 6 o'clock. So strap in for this great, uh, great day. Uh, speaking of births, I haven't physically seen them yet, but is Mike and Brittany here? All right, come on up. So I want to introduce you the, the newest member of our church family. Uh, her name is Anna Rebecca, and uh, a stork brought them, brought her, right? <laughs> you've, you've never heard that joke before, right? Not quite that easy. Yeah, yeah. Well, it wasn't quite that easy, she says. Okay, all right. But this is uh, Anna, and uh, what a beautiful blessing uh, she is, obviously, to you and also to our church family, and we're grateful for that. So let's celebrate that. Let's... Mike, do you have a hand for that? All right. Blessings to you guys. Uh, 
All right, just to, uh, as the service goes along, we have lots of different pieces. Those who are participating, just come on up as soon as you can, and uh, the service will go unannounced. It is going to be a longer service. The children will be released at part of the service. They'll be looked after during the, the duration of our service as well. Afterwards, just a reminder, we have a, a free lunch that is available for all of us. And uh, as a generosity a gift from Heinz and Erna Jansen, we're very grateful for that. And uh, Erna has uh, declared that even if you did not sign up for the food, she wants you to stay because there's enough food. Erna does not run out of food. <laughs> I saw five loaves and two fishes in the kitchen earlier, so she's got enough for everybody. So uh, we want to... Uh, uh, just to experience that blessing together as we eat as well. So let's open with prayer and then we'll begin. Father, we thank you for this blessing that we can celebrate your goodness in our lives here. We honor you and we praise you. This is all about you. And we uh, express our heart's desire to, to demonstrate to the world how great you are. We worship you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. share what God has done in the lives of uh, my family, the church's family, and... Sorry, Richard, it is working now. <laughs> I was told it was working. <laughs> okay. So anyways, the topic is markers along the way. And I could share for hours. I could share till 6 o'clock tonight, but Richard has promised if I go over over time, he will grab his hook and get me off of it from here. So I'm under a lot of pressure, so please bear with me. I'm going to share special God encounters, markers that relate to the birth and the, to this church. I share with one purpose in mind, and that is to give thanks, praise, honor, and glory to God alone. This church here is here because of God calling people in and people responding to his call. This church's birth came into being through God-given vision and prayer. To start with the conception, I need to go back to 1982. That is six years before this church came into being. I was in a, it was in the spring of 1982. My family and I were part of the Zion Mennonite Brethren Church. The Zion Church was a church that was started in the early 60s by a group of people that left the KMB for one single reason, and that was to establish a German-speaking ministry. By the 80s, there was no longer a need for an all-German-speaking congregation. The attendance on the Sunday morning had dropped from about 300 to about 50, and that left a huge burden on the remaining group. I was in leadership and the moderator of that church at that time. As a leader, we prayed and prayed, and we decided to call on the KMB and WMB and the, and the Ontario Conference for help. This group of leaders, after hearing us pray, discerning God's will, suggested that the Zion Church cease to function as a church and close its doors, and the people merge with the KMB or WMB. For me as a young leader, this was a devastating time, a very difficult time, and it was very very difficult for me to understand that. It was at that time that as I was going through this challenging time of people questioning me, why are you closing a church? I questioned God and God gave me a vision, a marker, that the closure of the Zion church would open the doors for a new church plant in this area. At that time, that was a comforting uh, vision, but I had no idea what it would look like at the end of the day. Since God gave me that vision to start a new church, I felt strong that the proceeds from the sale of the Zion building would stay in the KW area, and the Ontario Conference agreed with that. So, by September 1982, several families uh, merged with WMB and others with KMB. KMB Church, under the leadership of Pastor John Fraze, was a warm, loving, open, welcoming, gracious community to the group that came from the Zion Church. Our family 
had a very positive experience at KMB. It was a time of personal growth for Erna and I. Again, a special marker that I will never forget. It was an amazing time that God allowed us to enjoy, refuel, recuperate, and, and move on. It was so good that the vision that God had given me to plant a new church became very distant. It was sometime in 1983 I sensed God's call again, a marker, a special encounter again, that God renewed the vision that he had given me earlier. The renewed vision was much clearer to plant a new church in a new location with the purpose of reaching more people for Christ. After praying about it, I met with Pastor John Fraze and shared my vision of planting a new church. John Fraze was very open to this vision and together we presented it to the KMB board. There was an openness to this, and the, and the upshot, the long story was that a joint meeting was called between the WMB and KMB, and after presenting the vision of the new church plan, followed by prayer and discussion, there was consensus and support to start a new church. I believe that, that this is where Glen Cairn Church was conceived in a very preliminary stage, 1984. That's where the conception took place. The conception followed by a feasibility and strategy study. Next, an implementation church planting team was appointed. And since I was a carrier of the vision, I was part of the both uh, studies and also on the, the chair of the team that was to implement this vision. The mandate was of this team was quite diverse and included things like the church plant was going to be a mother-daughter concept, the church the mother churches were going to be helpful in providing the building, forming, and sending the new group. This team was also responsible for organizing and run the fund drive, procure and purchase land, define building type and size, hire architect, drawings, plans, permits, prepare budget, and get churches approvals, oversee the construction of the building, define the new church purpose and reason for its starting, spiritual design of the new church programs and its philosophy, identification of the new group and their leadership model, groundbreaking ceremony April 5th, 1987, prepare guiding principles for the new church and for the mission, new mission statement, prepare a statement of intention, invite those whom God was calling to this church plant was April 5th to April 30th, 1987, and those of you that are here from the beginning remember that time very well. That was an open window for our charter members to commit. Preliminary organizational meetings for the new church. Name the new church and choose the newly identified group. Before, ending, before the end of 1987, the new group was fully organized and structured to start all programs in, a new year, in the new year, 1988. During this time, I personally experienced many, many God encounters, many, many markers. December 31st, 1987 was again a very, very important market in, in my own life. KMB, our mother church, organized and sent out the new church as their missionaries in our community. I will never forget the beautiful, meaningful, heartfelt sending, a special marker, a special God encounter. KMB empowered, anointed, blessed, prayed, and sent us out as their missionaries, even though, even though it was only a couple of miles down the road. The new group consisted of 140 people, which 80 were formal members. At the time, at the end of the day, our mother church, which by now, for expansion reasons at WMB, was only KMB, had a bigger mortgage than this church, than Glencairn Church. As I reflect back, on the birth and process of starting this church, building this facility, the first facility, I have seen God's faithfulness over and over again and again. I've experienced many special markers, God encounters. I could share many, many stories, but I see Richard is keeping an eye on me. The God that gave the vision of planting this church is still the same God. He has not changed. This morning, I would like to give him all the glory, praise, and honor that is due to him. Thank you, thank you, Lord.
When I arrived here at Glencairn, I was content to sit in the back and uh, help out, but I, had, uh, I was very busy. I had little children, I had a new job, I didn't have time to get involved beyond just helping out on a Sunday morning. One year into the journey of Glencairn, uh, three men, and this is key, three men individually, separately, they had not talked to each other, I found that out later, came and approached me about considering intentional leadership here at Glencairn. Up to that point in my life, I had not even attended being on a committee, let alone chaired a committee. So I was uh, very unskilled at that. But Irene and I, my wife and I, took time to pray and ask God about that. And I agreed to let my name stand as a candidate for moderator at the church. And to a big surprise, uh, the church family elected me as church moderator. Hardy Clausen, Jerry Peters, and Peter Petker, each in their own unique way, became my encouragers, my instructors. They became, not intentionally, but they became like mentors to me. They pushed me and held me accountable, provided me with insightful feedback when necessary. My biggest support, though, came from my relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus began to reveal his gift of leadership to me. Romans 12 talks about the body of Christ having different gifts. In verse 8 it says, If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. It became my desire to lead well. But that just didn't happen all at the beginning. Just like a baby slowly learns to walk and talk, I too started slowly with lots of mistakes and mess-ups. I'm well aware that my words and actions at times were not God-honoring. But God is gracious to forgive, and so too you have been as my church family. I've had the privilege of serving multiple terms as both elder and moderator over the years. I've served with many gifted and godly men and women over the years along with all our pastors. I've been richly blessed and shaped by all of you in my journey as leader. The last eight or ten years, I believe Jesus put a longing in my heart to encourage and mentor younger men who were and are today where I was 30 years ago. I recognized the impact that older men had had in my walk of faith and service to God. Would there be an opportunity for me to give myself to the development and encouragement of younger men to live and serve biblically as followers of Jesus? I can confirm that this has been, in fact, has happened in the past and is also happening today. Meaningful and rich dialogue and interaction with other younger men has become a significant blessing for me. I've been invited into other men's lives to encourage them in their journey of their own life's challenges. I'm truly grateful for these young men. I also believe that future leaders are being shaped through these relationships. In closing, I have two messages for you, my church family. First of those of you who are my generation, my age group, both men and women, if you don't have at this point in your journey here at Glencairn at least one close relationship with someone a generation younger than yourself, I invite you to ask the Lord to grant you an open heart for someone of that generation. Find a person who you can get to know a bit deeper than just the surface stuff that we all so quickly default to. Ask them how they, you might pray for them and encourage them, and then begin to pray regularly for them and see how God leads in that relationship. And secondly, to you who are following us older folks, to those of you men and women who are in life where many of us charter members were when Glen Karen began, there's a vast resource of knowledge and experience from my generation waiting for you to tap into. Thirty years ago when Glen Karen started, there was only a handful of people over the age of 50. Today there's a whole lot more of us. If you haven't already, I invite you to ask Jesus to put someone on your heart to reach up to and build a relationship of mutual encouragement and trust. Take advantage of this opportunity that God has given Glenn Karen for this season. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, call up John Patterson and Gloria Wilson, and uh, they are going to be quizzed on their knowledge of Glen Cairns history. So come on down. So 
So we got four categories. We got statistics, ministries, pastors, and buildings. All right. So usually you guys uh, beep in, but we don't have that technology yet. So uh, we're just going to start with uh, Gloria. So Gloria, which category would you like? I'll start with pastors. For how much? Um, 200. 200. Pastors for 200. Okay, June 2008 was this pastor's transition from the associate pastor to the lead pastor. Do you know? Bill Stubbs? Bill Stubbs, yes! Who is Bill Stubbs? <laughs> Correct. All right, 200 goes to Gloria. John, which category would you like? Uh, ministries. For how much? 200. Okay, ministries for 200. The amount of food that Bridges receives from the food bank each month. And this is in pounds. How many pounds? 3,000. 3, Does he know? What is 3,000 pounds? Yes. Good. All right. 200 each. That seems a little rigged. That's okay, though. All right. Gloria. I'll do pastors for 300. Wow. All right. Pastors for 300. This pastor's career started the same year as Glenn Karen. I guess. It's your first boss you're being told. Yeah. I would say it must be... You? No, not me. No, uh, no, 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 no. I'm four. Four years for me, just by the way. Uh, John, do you have a guess? 88, so that's 30 years ago. I'm going to say um, Mark Johnson. No, not Mark Johnson. Any guesses from the crowd? Yeah? Richard, yes. Who is Richard Martins? One in the same. There you go. That was a tough one. Okay, next one. We'll go to John. John, what's your choice? Oh, let's do ministries again. Ministry, how much? Three hundred. Ministries for three hundred. The number of people that have been baptized in Glen Cairns history. We'll do the closest ten. All of them. All of them. Yeah, that's good. Uh, any guesses? Um. Wow, 30 years. 510. <laughs> wow, okay, it's lower than that. I'll... I'd say 250. Okay, we're getting closer, a little bit lower. Any other guesses from the audience? 161 is the answer. Some of you are pretty close. 161. Did you have it? 175, that's close, that's good. Okay, uh, next, Gloria? Building for 100. Building for 100. The animal that lived in the vents of the portables prior to its demolition. The demolition is referring to the building, not to the animal. Any, any guess what animal that was? I should know this. Um, I, I think it was a... Raccoon? Raccoon, answer. What are raccoons? Yes, good. Good. All right, John? Um, still got one in statistics, right? We got all three in all statistics. Three. Oh, yeah. Well, let's do statistics. For how much? 100? Yes. Okay, statistics for 100. The year that Glencairn was established. Established? Okay, whatever. You know the year that we're talking about. Trick question. Trick question. Um, it's not, not a trick question. 30 years ago from this year. 1988, yes. That's good, correct. All right. Next up, Gloria. I'll do uh, pastors for 100. Pastors for 100. The amount of lead pastors who have served throughout Glen Karen's history. No problem. I'm going to say six. Six? And the answer is? Yes, six. One interim and five permanent. Very good. All right. John. 
Statistics, 300. So, whew, okay, statistics, 300. The annual salary of Glen Karen's first lead pastor. First lead pastor. Glad you didn't ask me the current one. Yeah. <laughs> Can't count that high. Uh, first lead pastor. I'm going to say zero. No, not zero. It is an amount. Okay, 10,000. Okay, it's higher than that. Any guesses from the audience or Gloria? 25. 25, a little bit higher. Any guesses? 32. The answer is 32,000. Yeah, which is quite a bit today, so that's good. Okay, uh, John. Oh, okay. oh, wait, sorry, Gloria. Building for 300. Building for 300. The room in the new building that has needed repairs from water damage. New building, yes. There has been one room in the new building, there was a leaky faucet that got fixed. It's no longer leaking. Any guesses? The bathroom? No, not the bathroom. Not the kitchen. Anyone know from the audience? Yes? No, not the janitor's room. No. Close. Think close to toddler's bathroom. No, lead pastor's office. Yes, it was the lead pastor's office. Richard uh, was getting some water drops on his head. But it's fixed now and everything's happy, so don't worry. Okay, uh, John, back to you. Three left. Oh, finish statistics. Statistics for 200. <laughs> Man, again, 123 pounds of this food is given out each month by Bridges. That's false. Okay. These uh, statistics were given to me by Marilyn Harwick, so she uh, takes the heat. And the glory, too. So. You want me to give you a number? Uh, we'll get, like, what, what do you think we're talking about? Food is given out each month by Bridges. Yeah. Which of which food? This food? Yeah, of this food. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't even hear Oh, so it's your fault. My fault. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we'll put that down. So what is it? Probably rice. Is it? What is rice? Yes, what is rice? It is. Good. So Marilyn was correct. John was false. There we go. Okay. Uh, next up. Building for 200. Building for 200. The advent display that was handcrafted by Ron Wall. It was the nativity scene. What is the nativity scene? Yes. All right. And John, the last question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, never mind. You don't have to tell me which one it is. 8,482 people have been served food by this member of Glen Karen. Wow. By this member. <laughs> yeah, not at the same time. That's correct. Hmm. Erna Jansen. Who is Erna Jansen? Yes, that is Erna Jansen. All right, give our contestants a big round of applause. Good job. You guys are both winners in my heart. Thank you. What's that? Oh, yeah, children can uh, be dismissed now with, uh, with these guys. Good morning. Is this on? No. So we'll use this one. Uh, when Glen Karen started, um, our basement consisted of four classrooms and a small Sunday school office along that wall against the parking lot. And uh, we soon realized that that wasn't quite enough room for our growing congregation. So uh, the rest of the basement was just concrete, uh, block walls, concrete floor, concrete ceiling. So it was. Uh, it was only two to three years in that we realized that we needed to develop the remaining space. So we then added um, seven more classrooms and washrooms and the kids' auditorium downstairs where the kids just now went to blast. So that was one, one little addition that happened early on. And then in uh, 1997 or 98, I think it was 97 we started, and uh, our church was growing and programs were expanding. And our facility was increasingly becoming too small again. And we had uh, two and sometimes three Sunday school, adult Sunday school classes here in this room. And so you can imagine we had those rolling dividers trying to separate each class. And it was quite interesting to uh, try and contain Dave Anderson or Vic Thiessen or Hardy Clauston's boisterous teaching so the others wouldn't be uh, overhearing and uh, 
getting confused. But uh, so after some elders meetings and congregational approval, we were tasked to find a portable building for an interim space until we could build phase two, maybe 10 years or 15 years down the road. So we found a bank of uh, nine 12 by 60 trailers that were attached together that had come from the brand new Toyota plant in Cambridge that was just built. And these trailers were installed together and renovations done to the interior and exterior to create offices and six more classrooms totaling about 6,400 square feet of extra space and uh, with an additional permanent link from this uh, space to the new space. Uh, this was back when we could actually have volunteers helping and so we had lots of volunteer help to help with some of that painting and renovating and stuff as well. Um, yeah, I was, I was a little bit disheartened actually when that first went up because uh, we were just waiting for that new space to accommodate our, our adult Sunday school and that didn't really happen. So adult Sunday school kind of petered out a little bit at that point. Uh, we still had some classes over there over the course of the next years, but it, um, for some reason it was never quite the same uh, as it was in here. But uh, it was actually Doris Falkenberger's prayers that were answered with that building. <laughs> As, as others as well, but um, she had a space then where she could expand her bridges dream and uh, that was really exciting to see that take place. Um, and so that taught me a lesson that uh, we can do a lot of planning and figuring out, but sometimes God has a different plan and that's, that's really what that time period taught me. And, uh, but I still do have uh, a little bit of bad feeling about there's a family of destitute raccoons that are now <laughs> unchurched and <laughs> we did not do our part in reaching out to that <laughs> sector. Thank you. Uh, Sandra Reimer. In every family there are difficult and painful experiences. As a church family, we have had our share of challenges. By and large, these painful times have pruned us individually and collectively as we have embraced what God was doing rather than running from it. I have attended Glencairn with my husband Wes and our two children, Quinn and Zoe, for the past 17 years. During that time, we have witnessed the premature departure of two pastors, a former pastor who had great impact for God's kingdom, later drifting away from a relationship with God, the death of beloved church members, a severe decline in church attendance and morale, which led us to going through an important refocusing exercise, and six months without a paid lead pastor. Before our time, there were conflicts that resulted in some people leaving the church, and Glenn Karen's first paid pastor leaving after only two years due to conflicts. <clears throat> when I reflect on the pastors who left in the midst of conflict, I realize that not everyone agrees on what happened or didn't happen. I remember one of our pastors fondly and the way he enriched my life, while others remember being disappointed by this same pastor. Each leader who has been part of our history has helped to shape our church body positively and negatively. Our refocusing process in 2013 was an important time of forgiving and releasing some of the negative impacts and celebrating the positive contributions of past leaders. The deaths of congregation members has been another thing that has brought pain, but also um, it, God has taught us through it. Many of us remember the deaths of Hardy Clausen, Wally Falkenberger, Jim Somerville, and more recently, Jean Wall. I still miss Jean. I remember the comfort of emailing her a prayer request and receiving an encouraging note in return. There was something special about knowing that Jean had my back. The way Jesus shone through Jean in the midst of her gradual decline from terminal cancer still reverberates in my soul. She truly was a jar of clay filled with kingdom treasure. I also remember the death of Jim Somerville and the effect it had on me. Though I respected and appreciated Jim, our families were not close, 
And yet when he died, I felt like part of my life was diminished. I remember giving his wife Becky a homemade card with an image of a quilt with one of the squares raggedly torn out. That's how I felt about Jim's death, like the fabric of our community had been damaged. It's still a reminder to me that we are intimately connected as a church family. The choices I make, both positive and negative, are not a private matter. They affect my family, my friends, and this church. The greater the influence a person has, the wider the ripple effect of their choices. As the Bible says in Romans 12, the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Something I appreciate about the community here at Glen Cairn is that for me and my family, and for many others, it is a place where we can be honest about suffering. We are a community of open-hearted, deep listeners who feel comfortable being present with people in their suffering. We are also quick to pray and to invite God's healing into the broken places of our individual and collective lives. For this, I am exceedingly grateful. Thank you. The theme of today, of course, is celebration. We want this room to be filled with, with uh, praise and joy and thanksgiving in our hearts. So why do we include a section on, on pain? Uh, it's because it's part of the journey, isn't it? We know that. It's part of life. It's part of what we experience. There is, there is sin. There is um, uh, pride and selfishness. There is death. We encounter that. Uh, but God uses even those moments to help us know more deeply about who he is and what he wants to accomplish in our lives. And nowhere do we see that more profoundly in the celebration of communion. We have this dichotomy of joy and sorrow. Sorrow because we have the, the realization of our sin that brought Jesus to the suffering, to the whipping and the beating and the horrible uh, persecution on the cross. That's not something you can whitewash. It's not something you can just glance over. It is a horrifying thing. But we also have the joy, of course, because Jesus gave his body. He willingly did this for us so that not only would we uh, experience uh, healing, but that we would have the joy and the ecstasy of having communion with him. And so we we celebrate communion with both a humble attitude as we realize that our sin is this horrifying, devastating thing that has really brought about this, this distance and this inability to have a relationship with God. But then we celebrate because God has enabled us to know him, the God who has created the universe. We can be in relationship and all of the things that we're celebrating today come from that. And so we, I want to invite you to participate in communion this morning with that dichotomy in our hearts that we do need to confess, we do need to repent of our sin, we realize that our sin is, is what is separating us from God, but we come rejoicing in knowing what he has done for us. And so uh, the new covenant that he has opened up through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. So let me pray, and then we're going to invite you to come and participate. There are three stations at the front, a fourth one at the back. Uh, the team will play for us as we do that. So let's just pray. God, we give you thanks for this re uh, reminder of what you have done, that you have willingly sacrificed your life so that we might have the joy and the privilege of knowing you. And God, we come with a, with a humble heart, knowing that uh, we need you, that this debt that we owe you is infinite. There's nothing that we can do to overcome it. It is only through you and your action. And we rejoice over that, God. Thank you. We praise your name for that. So as we participate, may it fill our hearts and may we also express that joy and love to others as we go along in life. 
We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm here today to tell you the Bridges story, actually, Ralph mentioned earlier. So the Bridges story starts in 1996 with God putting a burden on some of us at Glen Cairn Church for the poor in our community. And I decided to check this out with those of us that were carrying this burden. We were so excited about what God might want to do with us and through us that we presented a plan to him. We wanted to get a bus refurbished, take food to our Glencairn neighbors, sort, um, sort of like the food trucks we have now. I guess we were a little bit ahead of our time, and probably God's too. The logistics of such an undertaking at that time just seemed to be too big for us. Research also showed that there were hardly any disadvantaged people in the Glencairn neighborhood. Did we not get this burden from the Lord? Would we let fear set in? Should we just give up? Well, we, however, continued to pray and ask the Lord to show his plan to us. So God impressed on me that his plan was the right and good plan for us at Glencairn Church. He highlighted Isaiah 58, verses 7 and 12, where it talks about sharing our food with the hungry and inviting the homeless poor into our homes, our church home. And when we see the shivering or poorly dressed, to clothe them and also be available to our own families. You will be known as those who can fix anything, make the community livable again. As we were a fearful little group with all the human weaknesses and inadequacies, God imparted on us that if we opened our doors wide, he would send the nations. This encouraged us to talk to leadership, and we found out that a portable unit would be added to our building, and would we want to use space in it to serve the people God had put on our hearts. We came up with the name Bridges for our new ministry, Building Bridges with our community. We decided to give what we have. We asked some businesses to donate shelves and clothing racks. The congregation provided non-perishable food and gently used clothing. Can you imagine we even pressed these clothing to make them look presentable? We occupied one room the size of our li library now. We didn't ask for any money because we sensed God wanted us to stand on his promises. And all we needed to do was obey him and love the people. We advertised our new Bridges store in the neighborhood for about three months. So open day finally came, and we had about eight to nine families come, and we just loved them to pieces. I think word of mouth is the most powerful advertising tool, however, because our clients spread the word about us, and every opening, the numbers of clients increased slowly. And they didn't only come from the Glencairn neighborhood either. They came from all over the city. We also noticed that they came from different countries and continents, immigrants and refugees included. We were told that they liked to have a choice in what to take off the food shelves versus giving a pre-packaged food hamper. Eventually, we couldn't provide all the food we needed and became members of the regional food bank here in Kitchener for a yearly fee. Interestingly enough, we never had a shortage of clothing. Even though we never asked for money, some in our church family donated to the Bridges Ministry, and we realized that we were ready to do more. That required, however, more efficient record keeping, occupy more space to create clothing room, a coffee room, a, the gym for games and sports activities, the bridges sorting room, and office, and so on went on. More volunteers were needed all around. We also started special initiatives like Christmas celebrations, toy giveaway, back to school supplies, and definitely the pancake breakfast. We even had a parish nurse for a while, and now there is a volunteer uh, to help our clients find jobs. For a time, we had a prayer box and were invited to pray for the requests our clients brought. 
All the practical things were taking shape, and many changes had happened since then in our church and in our city. But the message of Christ remains the same, and the coffee room especially is a place to connect with our Bridges family on a personal basis as they are waiting to be served. Over a cup of coffee or tea and a cookie, volunteers in that area have some pretty significant conversations about people's circumstances, religion, hardships, relationships of various kinds. If you were to ask them, they would verify that they are experiencing some real God stories. Stories of answered prayer and connecting deeply about spiritual matters. God is encouraging all of us in developing friendships that open doors in sharing and introducing Jesus in this unique setting and then inviting them to join us in following Christ. God is the one who established this Bridges family among us. He has brought about this ministry and was, is, and continues to be faithful in growing us by reaching out a hand to take hold of and loving with all that is within us to give. God has brought over 70 nations to love right here at home. God reminds us when we see one of the Bridges clients, we see him. When we offer a cup of coffee or tea in conversation, we have done it for Jesus. When we give clothing, we clothe him. We love him because he first loved us. Thank you. Thank you, Doris. The experience of God's presence and power in any church is dependent on the prayer that happens in that church. And our good Lord has graced Glen Karen throughout the past 30 years in two ways. First, by placing here people who believe that prayer makes a difference. And secondly, as we have already heard, by bringing about seasons in which we are more ready and willing to drop to our knees to pray. And both of these are grace gifts from God to us, and we're grateful for for the people and for the circumstances that encourage us to pray. A prayer is quiet work, it's hidden work, it's not easy to quantify and I don't have stats on how many hours of prayer per week or month or year go up to heaven from the hearts of the people of Glencairn, but I do have a steady stream of pieces of evidence that we are a praying church and that we regularly experience the, the, the amazing difference that prayer makes. Throughout Glencairn's past, there were people praying behind the scenes. For example, there were people, who small group, who would come here on Saturday evenings to worship and pray to prepare this space for worship for the Sunday morning. Just before I was prayed into Glencairn, we had a very small number of children and young families, and the leaders decided to circle around the building and pray that God would send children, young families, and give us the means to look after them well. And today, we are enjoying the outcome of that prayer. Even more so in prayer, we have received collective promises of God for more visions and promises of Glencairn being a life-giving stream or a fruitful tree coming right here in the center of the sanctuary with roots going deep into God's life. And we're still praying into those promises and visions, trusting that God has more for us in the future. More recently, prayer has moved even closer to the center of who we are. Under the leadership of Doris Falkenberger, we have established a number of circles of intercessors. We have the I team. We have the Pray Today team. We have intercessors for children, for youth, for each worship team, and in fact, for every ministry and more. Prayer and dependence on God are our current strategic priority to ensure intentional steps for us as a congregation in that direction. We have regular prayer walks throughout the, the, the neighborhood. This summer, Vic, who is our um, ch chair of our the elders, encouraged us leaders to circle the building uh, each week and pray for the pressing needs that we are facing today. And we have already seen the Lord respond. Bond. We have monthly prayer summits, and we're seeing prayer spill into all our gathering, big or small. 
I have personally been blessed by people who I know really pray. John Patterson, who prayed for our son, and the Lord decided to wake him up at 4 a.m. to do that every day. Fred Weens, who faithfully prays for Glencairn leadership. We have already heard about Jean Wall, whom we have lost, a mighty prayer warrior, but her prayers will be covering us far into the future. And we have Doris and Meka, Sharon, Bruce, Vic, Irene, and many, many others, you know who you are, who pray as soon as the need is known. And of course, we have Lana, who is currently leading the ever-growing prayer movement at Glencairn. This is good. This is because uh, it, it is through prayer that our hope and our future are secured. The Lord gave me Deuteronomy 8 for this morning as I was preparing to share about prayer. And in Deuteronomy 8, Moses is reminding God's people of this. He tells them, remember the whole way by which he has brought you these, I'll say 30 years, through the desert, and so that he might, sometimes by humbling you, test you to see if you have it in, within you to keep his commandments or not. And so he humbled us by making us hungry, and then he fed us in new and unfamiliar ways. He did this to teach us that we do not live by bread alone, but by everything that comes from the Lord's mouth. Our clothing did not wear out, nor did our feet swell all these years of being here. For the Lord our God is bringing us into a good land, a land of brooks, springs, and fountains flowing forth in valleys and hills, a land of wheat, barley, vines, fig trees, and pomegranates of olive trees and honey, a land where we may find, eat food in plenty, and find no lack of anything, a land whose stones are iron and from whose hills we can mine copper, lots of resources that God is promising. And we will eat our fill and praise the Lord, our God, because of the good things he has given us. But we must be sure we do not forget the Lord, our God, by not keeping his commandments. And when we eat our fill and when we build and occupy our new building space, when our resources increase and when we have an abundance of everything, we must be sure we do not feel self-important and forget the Lord our God who brought us thus far to this place. We must be careful not to say it is our own ability and our own skill that has gotten us this wealth. And we have already heard plenty of evidence here that the glory for our past goes squarely to the Lord. So I want to invite you now to take a few minutes to actually pray. Uh, find a neighbor or two. Uh, there are five points of prayer on the slide. Uh, give thanks to, uh, for, to God for our past presence. Give thanks to those who model prayer in our midst and ask for more like that, that we might be an army of prayer warriors causing foundational shifts in the fabric of reality. Ask for an increased desire for us to pray as a congregation, as leadership, because that's what secures our future. Express confidence in God's yet future goodness, trust in, in the provision that he still has for our church. And finally, express the desire for more of God with us. So turn around, find a friend, take about a minute for each point, and let's fill the room with voices as we pray and give thanks to God. blessing that we sense God is uh, wanting to have for us as a church. Uh, I am not Peter Burkhardt, but Peter is actually not feeling well. Uh, he's actually in the hospital, and uh, we need to pray for him as he's dealing with uh, some sickness. And uh, so I'm going to be repeat, uh, reporting, uh, sharing his report to us. Uh, he talks uh, briefly about how when he and Laura first came to this church, it was a little bit of an adjustment for them when they were worshiping at Kitchener Mennonite Brethren Church and the beautiful sanctuary that they had coming now to worship in a gym, which was felt a little bit odd to them, a little bit more institutional, and it took them a while before it felt comfortable for them to, to worship in this place. But it did happen. 
three years ago, he mentions that when we first started talking about this building project, that uh, there was conversation about uh, building a separate worship center just for, uh, for the gatherings on Sunday mornings. We realized that that amount of money was going to be quite a bit higher than we thought we could afford. And also, it didn't quite fit in with who we were as a church. And uh, based upon all the input that we received from the ministry leaders and so on, we came up with this plan, which we now have, and it feels like it's, it fits in very well with who we are as a church. And Peter says he thinks that worshiping here in this gym is actually very beautiful for him. Um, so he talks about the estimate for the building project is two and a half million dollars. Uh, that that's a lot of money, and we had to figure out how to deal with that. So we we did have a uh, pledge, uh, a giving campaign that we invited the church to uh, make pledges towards this. So we set a goal of five hundred thousand dollars, and uh, when the final day came to reveal the pledges, we found out that it totaled up to over five hundred and seventy thousand dollars. And we saw we rejoiced over that. We definitely. Saw saw that as a hand of God upon us and a sign that God was wanting us to pursue uh, this work of uh, building this building. And uh, not only that, just a sense that sometimes uh, when you give a pledge, that's all it is. It's a pledge. And there are various reasons why somebody may not be able to fulfill that pledge. But we can say two and a half, le- two and a half years later that we are right in line with the pledges that were given two and a half years ago. We're still uh, satisfying all of those uh, pledges, which is amazing, uh, amazing gift to us. So here we are today. Uh, we are in this this building, and we know that it costs money. It costs money to start. It costs money to to uh, to maintain. It costs money for a mortgage and so on. And uh, he says that this is a very good investment for the future. He talks about the parable of the talents, where uh, the ruler, rich ruler, left and gave uh, three of his servants control over uh, some money, and two of those invested, whereas a third servant was burying this money out of fear rather than investing the money. And the ruler condemns the servant for that. Uh, And he says the message for him is very clear that God has called us to invest in this this, uh, gift that he has given to us for the building up of his kingdom. And he says, I see the commitment we as a congregation have made with this building as that investment. God has equipped us with the financial resources, and we have heard him call us to invest here. But I want to challenge each of us here today. This is Peter speaking. If this building is our investment in in his kingdom, that means we're also charged to use it as a tool in building that kingdom. And that means looking for ways that we can leverage this gift from God to bring others to know him. That means looking for ways to invite people in, not to bury it by making it unwelcome to visitors and our surrounding community. He talks about the, you know, this question that's often asked, if your church were to no longer exist, would the community notice? And, uh, and uh, he says that the, the important question is, would this, le- if Glencairn ceased to exist, would the fabric of the Glencairn community would it leave a hole in this community? And he says, my prayer is that our commitment is to invest our talent here that would make a difference as we invite others to join us in following Jesus. Okay. Um, my name is Nathan Dorsch, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the Church and Community Ministry. Uh, This is the team of Marilyn and Eldon Hartwick and Rich Schaefer, currently led by Matt and Sarah Peters. My wife Rachel and I led or participated in this ministry uh, from 2010 until this summer when we transitioned back into youth leadership with the junior youth. The Glencairn congregation has always had an open doors and open arms for our community. Uh, We've heard a lot of it today, uh, but going back from Adventure Club, uh, Junior Stars, basketball, uh, ball hockey, and of course bridges. There have always been many activities to bring the community into the church. When we started to focus on going further to connect locally, it was done informally and opportunistically. Uh, Glen Karen was undergoing significant change and transformation and discerning where God was calling the church. So with limited resources to start a local missions ministry, uh, 
we looked for partnerships and connections. We found these in the form of 614 St. Jamestown, uh, Thorncliffe Park, WMB, Ray of Hope, Welcome Home, and the MB Mission Awake events that so many of you had participated in. Our local outreach and ministry began to take shape in the form of these events, allowing opportunities for those in the congregation to participate and connect with whatever community we were working in at the time. After the refocusing effort that we've heard about today uh, within Glencairn had c concluded, there's a significant pull from God to continue and increase the church's presence in the community, and the ministry team was born. With early guidance from Dave Anderson and the Global Missions team, as well as work with Pastor Ingrid to structure the ministry and the team, we started to formalize and intentionally create opportunities for the immediate community to come through the church doors and engage with the congregation, allowing God to make the connections with open hearts and minds. This took the form of carnivals, movie nights, Christmas dinners, and gym nights. We were challenged to look at Glen Karen from the neighborhood's point of view and to echo what Richards just said on behalf of Peter. Would anyone notice if Glen Karen closed its doors? Would, <laughs> would the neighborhood notice or would they miss us? Looking now at where this ministry is today under the guidance of Matt and Sarah, the future looks very exciting. Glen Karen's building connections within the community in the form of partnerships with Williamsburg and Country Hills Community Centers. And with the blessing of this new facility and space, we need to ask ourselves, how can we facilitate more interactions with the community? God has plans for this space, and I can tell you the neighborhood is taking notice. Uh, for those of you that were here yesterday, you saw it. The community leaders are taking notice. They're showing up, and they know who we are. Glen Cairn's blessed to have many volunteers and support from the congregation as this ministry has evolved and grown. As we look for new ways to connect and engage the community, and as the church grows, it's important to continue to branch out and to understand who in the congregation is interested in serving and what skill sets exist here. Please consider reaching out to one of the church and community team members or filling out the survey that's been provided uh, if you're interested or you have skills that you can share. In closing, I just want to leave you with the verse uh, that we as a ministry team used as a guide early on. Isaiah 61, verse 4. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing cities destroyed long ago. They will revive them, though they've been deserted for many generations. We all have a role to play in shining Glen Glencairn's light to the community. And while today's a day to celebrate the history of what's been done, let's look to the future of what God has in store for Glencairn. Uh, lastly, this is a little off script, Richard, but I just want to thank everybody that shared today. Uh, all of those that have come before me on this stage have had an impact on me. Um, <laughs> I've been going to this church since I was about nine years old. Uh, called into leadership and challenge uh, at the age of 15 by Frank and Libby Peters, uh, Dean and Jody Perkins, uh, and then called again into leadership by Matt and Sarah uh, when we started youth 10 years ago. Uh, and without those generations going ahead of me, I wouldn't be up here today. So thank you very much. We want to acknowledge the building team. So if they can come forward, so that's Ray Braun, that's uh, John Biffis, uh, Barry Bishop, uh, Blaine Ruckwald, Heinz Jansen. Uh, I think that's, that's every, oh, Mark Falkenberger, right. Um, if he's coming up here, I'd like to have you come forward. As they're coming forward, I just want to... Uh, uh, acknowledge their tremendous sacrifice, the gift that we... You guys can come right on up uh, so that we can all see you. Um, the tremendous sacrifice, uh, their generosity in their time, their efforts, their energy. It, you cannot overestimate the amount of time that they have given. We also probably need to thank their wives for their sacrifice, quite frankly. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Barry and, and I have become best friends because I see him more than my wife now. Uh, he is here constantly doing so many things, and uh, we're so grateful for that. Blaine continues to serve as the chair of the facilities team, and uh, he had to deal with a, a, a leg a problem for many months, and, uh, but now he's, he's upright, and we're grateful for that and continuing to serve. And Heinz's uh, gift for us is his background in, in uh, renovations and uh, some all the experience that he has. John is the money guy, 
and uh, he's very wealthy as a result. And uh, <laughs> Mark Falkenberger, he is the know-it-all guy. And I mean that in the kindest way. He just knows it all. And uh, he worked very well with the architects. I mean, that's part of his vocation, of course. And he is a tremendous gift to us and his skill and his expertise that he brought to our church uh, in the building. And of course, Ray. Uh, Ray went through cancer and through surgery. And uh, I don't know of anybody who has persevered more than him. Uh, and uh, his gift is leadership, and he led this team uh, in such marvelous, fantastic ways. Uh, he, uh, I love him, but he sometimes uh, exerts too much energy. He was here this past week every day in the heat, uh, raking, uh, preparing the lawn, but his commitment is seen uh, through that and through many other ways. And uh, we are so grateful. I, I think we need to give them another hand. Let's appreciate them. We, uh, I want to give a word of a prayer of thanksgiving to them. And, uh, and also, uh, I know that their, their job isn't quite finished. They still have a little things here and there, uh, just the nature of building. They'll still be uh, in contact with the Nith Valley construction and, and so on. But the building is largely done. And, and I want to say, at, aside from these small things, we release you of the burden of what you have carried for for a year and a half, two years now uh, in this process. And uh, thank you so much for, for the work that you've put into this. And now Blaine's going to carry the work. He's, uh, he's a facilities chair. So if you have any issues with facilities, uh, he's the man to talk to. And uh, his work isn't finished. But uh, anyways, let's give thanks in prayer. Father, we do thank you for these men that you have gifted us with. You have provided for them uh, throughout this time. Um, God, we, we are thankful that they represent you in their sacrifice and their generosity. Uh, they represent you in their love for you and their love for, for the church and for the family. Uh, Father, I, I thank you for the way that you have sustained them, that you have given them grace in this journey. I pray that you would give them rest, that you would have, uh, give them the sense of satisfaction and enjoyment that their work is coming to a close and that they can look to you and give you thanks. And we pray this and your blessing to be upon them in Jesus' name. And Father, as we enter now into our offering, I also give you thanks that we can serve you and worship you in practical ways, such as giving you a portion of what you have given to us. And we give you thanks for that as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to invite the ushers to come forward, and we're going to take up the offering and uh, give thanks to God through that. Is this? Yeah. Okay. So today I will be sharing my brief testimony on how Glen Karen has shaped me and my faith. To start, I'm going to take you all the way back to the very beginning, five years ago. <laughs> my good friend John asked if t uh, myself and my wife Taylor would like to attend and be youth leaders at Glen Karen Church. His exact words, and I quote, were, we can be pew buddies. So you can imagine my disappointment when I come to Glen Karen for the first time and see that there are no pews. <laughs> In all seriousness, no, though, excuse me, when John first asked me to share my testimony on how being a part of Glen Cairn has shaped me, the first thing that popped into my head was all of the people that make up the church. I thought about the amazing friends I've made, the life group that I'm a part of, the dedicated pastors, and the youth group. All of these people have helped me grow in my faith, and this encourages me. Ooh, nope. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. All of these people have helped me grow in my faith, and this encourages me to strengthen my relationship with Christ. As I thought about it more, though, I couldn't help but think about how we are all sinners, how we all fall short, and how we all make mistakes. It's important for me to remember this because it helps me see Christ in everything our church does. It is only through Jesus that we can have a relationship with God and to, and to be a part of a body of believers that works toward glorifying God and everything they do is amazing. When I look at my relationship with Christ before I came to Glen Cairn compared to now, I can see a difference. I can see that the Holy Spirit is working in this body of believers, and I can see, I can see that God is being glorified here, 
and I can be thankful that God has blessed me with a church that is Christ-centered above all else. All of these things and more have helped me grow and change in a way that I can only attribute to God and the work that he does and the people who serve him. One last thing that I just wanted to highlight is the area in which I believe I have grown the most since attending Glencairn. I am somebody who really does not enjoy reading, and naturally this has caused me to struggle when it came to reading my Bible. In the last year, however, with some help of my friends at the church, I have really enjoyed reading and studying God's Word and experiencing all the blessings that come along with that. To close, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody here. You have helped me and you continue to help me grow in my faith, and I pray that God's kingdom will continue to be built here. Thank you. Asked uh, Curtis to speak as just one of the many people uh, among our youth and young adults that could have shared this morning. So thank you, Curtis, for sharing. And uh, yeah, we are pew buddies, but we have been seat buddies, so that's been really cool. And looking back four years, I never would have thought we would be at this place now, which is really cool. Uh, thinking about Glen Karen, it is important for us not only to remember that the youth and young adults need the church, but that the church needs the youth and young adults. And not just that the youth and young adults are the future of the church, but that youth and young adults are a part of the church in the same way everyone else is. And so as we look forward to the future of when Glenn Karen is going, we pray that the youth and young adults continue to be the center, uh, a part of the heartbeat of what's going on here, and that we would continue to uh, raise up people who love Jesus and want to live for him holistically and radically in their everyday lives. And so that's our prayer for the future. Hey, my name is Ed Willems, and I get the privilege of representing your sister churches across Ontario. And on all their behalf, in this moment of celebration, lifting up the name of Jesus, I simply want to say, well done. Well done. Let's lift up a name, uh, just the celebration again to Jesus as we close this morning uh, in prayer. Jesus, I thank you for this community. I thank you for Glen Karen. I thank you for every individual, uh, those who give leadership, those who come on a regular basis, those who are impacted through ministries like Bridges, those who are part of this community, those who are not yet even coming in the doors, but you desire for them to be a part of your kingdom and your family. Thank you for what you have done in these 30 years. I pray that it will just continue, that the celebration will continue, and that your name will be lifted high here in this community. Thanks for the partnership that we can have together. And God, may it continue to grow, I pray. And for the food that I believe we're about to eat, we give you thanks for those who have prepared it. Thanks so much. God, we lift you high. And ultimately, it's all about you. And we say thanks. Amen. Amen. I just wanted to make one additional comment. Because of all the great stuff happening... We're coming here February 22 to 23 for our Ontario Convention. I look forward to seeing many of you.